Okay, amazing. So let's get started with this lecture, guys, today. Uh, this is going to be day three of the dynamic programming bootcamp that I've been running at um, IIT Gandhinagar. Uh, we've uh, you know, already had two lectures in this series, and in the previous two lectures, we've talked about what? Uh, the first lecture was mostly about introduction to dynamic programming, memoization, then a little bit about recursive DP in general, and we also solved a bunch of problems in the first lecture. Uh, as far as the second lecture is concerned, just a minute, yeah. As far as the second lecture is concerned, uh, what did we do? We were uh, first of all solving the homework problems, and then we talked about things like recursive versus iterative DP, like uh, which one should you use when. Secondly, we also talked about a general trick to solve any dynamic programming problem. So in case you know you don't have a lot of idea about these topics, I would recommend starting from either the first lecture or the second lecture in the, in the series. But in case you already have idea about all of these things, uh, day three or you know the lecture third would be a great place to start, right? So before we talk about today's uh, concept, like the concept that I want to cover today, we will first of all be covering the homework problems that I had given you yesterday. So there were three homework problems and I would like to know from you guys, uh, how many of you tried out these problems? So I had given you three problems and all of these three problems were from CSES problem set. So like a plus one or a minus one in the chat quickly in case you've already tried them out. Um, like in case you were not attending the lecture live yesterday, maybe you would have seen the recording on YouTube. Okay, I see one plus one here. Great. Okay, so most of you haven't really tried out those problems. Uh, okay, that's not a problem, uh, but although like I would kind of expect from you guys that when you're attending a class, uh, Try to at least read those problems which I give you as homework in the previous class. That would be great, right? So yeah, I mean that's that's not a problem here because these problems won't really take a lot of time. Right? So let's talk about this first problem. This was the first problem in the homework, which was this the CSS problem set. Right? Uh, I mean the fourth yeah the fourth the fourth problem in the CSS problem set. Right? So this problem says that uh, consider a money system consisting of n coins. Each coin has a positive integer value. Your task is to ca calculate the number of distinct ordered ways you can produce a money sum x using the available coins, right? So for example, if you look at uh, this sample case given to you, you have two, three, five as the denominations of the coin, and then the required or the desired sum is nine. So the question tells us that there are three ways to construct this, which is this one. The first one is two plus two plus five. The second is three plus three plus three. The third, the third is two plus two plus two plus three, right? So the main, uh, you know, condition in this problem. So basically, we also talked about this problem, right? We also talked about coin combinations one. Now the only condition, I mean, the only difference between coin combinations one and coin combinations two, is that the order of coins actually matters in the second problem. So basically, if I say that two plus two plus five is equal to nine, and this is one of the ways to construct nine, then in the first problem that we had discussed yesterday, this was also one valid way. Two plus five plus two is equal to nine. This would have been considered a valid way. But in this problem that you're solving today, this is not considered as a valid way. We are only concerned about the ordered number of ways. Okay, so basically two plus two plus five is equal to nine. This is, this is allowed, but two plus five plus two is not allowed because that is nothing but a rearrangement of the uh, previous case, right? So how do you go about solving this problem? In the previous problem, what we were doing was this. We had considered this DP state, DP of i is equal to uh, number of ways to make a sum equal to i. This is what we were doing, right? We were not concerned about the order. And how was the transition? A transition was nothing but something like this. DP of i is equal to summation of I'm sorry. DP of i minus i minus coins coins k, uh, where k was going from one to n. So basically, we were considering all the coins, and this was our DP transition, right? What I mean by this is that if you have i, you want to construct i, then i can be constructed from let's say i minus coins one. Coins one could be let's say ten. Uh, it could be constructed from i minus coins two, and coins two could be something like two. It could be constructed from i, mi uh, I minus coins three, and which could be something like let's say twelve, right? 
So this was the transition. But can you see that if I just normally consider this thing, like, you know, let's say I want to find out DP of 10, right? And I have these denominations available. I have two and three. So how will I construct DP of 10? I will construct it from first of all, DP of seven and then DP of eight, basically 10 minus three and 10 minus um, 10 minus two, right? Then as far as DP of seven is concerned, I would be picking it up from DP of um, what DP of four and DP of five, right? Similarly, this uh, DP of eight would be constructed from what DP of, um, so you subtract three and you get five and you subtract two and you get six. But understand this thing. When, when I'm saying I want to construct 10 and I'm saying I am doing what here? I am doing a plus three. And here I'm doing a plus two, right? And similarly for this case as well, I am doing a plus two here. And then in this case, I'm doing a plus three. So can you see that just considering the previous uh, DP transition state, we are going, we are getting into what overlapping, like not overlapping sub problems, but uh, we are doing over counting. Basically we would count it twice when we are doing plus two, and then plus three. And in the second case, when we are doing plus three and then plus two, aren't these two things the same? This plus three and plus two and this plus three and I mean, basically these two things, the first one and the second one, they're same, right? So that's the problem here. We cannot use the previous DP transition here. So tell me one thing, does the order of the coins that I'm picking up matters in this problem or not? Does the order of coins matter in this problem? I mean, what, what I'm saying here is that uh, it actually matters kind of, uh, I mean, we're not considering these two as different ways, right? In the previous problem, it was like, if you have plus two and if you have then plus three, or if you have plus three first and if you have then plus two, the order really doesn't really matter. Like both of these are concerned, uh, considered different. But in this case, we are saying that, you know, the order actually matters. We always want to either say, okay, we always want to say either pick up plus two and then plus three, either you do like this, okay? Like you, you pick up like this, but if you're doing something like this, never pick up then plus three and plus two. Is this making sense? That if I'm saying in the problem, always pick up the coins in this order, plus two and plus three, then never pick up plus three and plus two like this. Right, yeah, exactly. So yeah, I, I think I should have asked this question in a little better way, but you guys get the idea, right? That the coins, the order now actually matters in which order you're picking up these coins. So tell me one thing, if I always pick up coins in a sorted order, let's say I pick up first plus two, and then I pick up, let's say another plus two, and then let's say I pick up plus three. If I'm making sure that the order of coins is, is in a sorted manner, like the coins that I'm picking up, basically coins of, coins of I is less than equal to coins of I plus one. If I'm making sure that this condition holds, can I say that the order that, or basically the construction that I'm making would be unique? Basically, I will never, I will never consider these two possibilities differently. Plus two, plus two, and then plus three. And like, uh, you know, we, we are not supposed to consider this as a different possibility. Plus three, plus two, and then plus two, right? So tell me one thing, if I'm making sure that the order in which I'm picking up the coins is in a sorted order. Basically, if I'm, if I'm let's say picking up plus two, then I'm picking up plus two. And then if I'm picking up plus two, after, oh sorry, if I'm picking up plus three now, after picking up this plus three, I can never pick up a smaller coin than plus three. Then tell me one thing, if I'm making sure that this happens, can I say that the order that I'm considering now will be unique? Like it will not consider, it will not have over, over counting, right? So now tell me one thing, like how, how would you like, uh, you know, do some transition here and what would be your DP state? Now think about it very carefully. Uh, when I when I talked about when I talked about state, what are the what are the conditions for a state? First of all, you look at the entire problem. Okay, then you try to break it down into chunks, smaller sub problems, and then these smaller sub problems you try to distinguish them. Like if you have one state, state S one, and if you have state S two, you should be able to distinguish S one and S two based on some parameters, right? So tell me one thing. If I'm saying like in the last problem, I was saying DP of x. Tell me the number of ways to construct construct uh, a sum of X. This was our DP state. Tell me one thing here, when I'm saying DP of X, am I storing this information that what was the last coin that was picked up? Am I storing this information here in this in the state? Yes or no? When I'm saying just DP of X, DP of X being the number of ways 
to construct a sum of x. Here I'm not considering the previous point that I was picked that I had picked up. So if I'm not considering the previous point that I had picked up, will I be able to make my next choice properly? I will not be able to make my next choice because what was the condition? The condition was coins of i should be less than equal to coins of i plus one. Basically, the coins that I'm picking up. If I've picked up this coin, if I've let's say picked up uh, coin two, I should be picking up coin four next, or basically three next. I can never pick. I can also pick up two. Okay, I can also pick up two again. But I can I pick up one after two? Can I do something like this? Two comma one. I cannot. Right. So you guys get the idea. We will have to have some other parameter to define which was the last coin that was picked up. Right. So let's let's try to see how what is the denomination of the coins. DP of somebody saying DP of x comma i where cij is the highest coin you can choose and x is the target value. That's a great DP state. Uh, but I would like to you know discuss one more DP state with you guys. Like let's say you know I give you a state like this. First of all, look at this. Look at the constraint. N is the number of coins which is going up till hundred. X is the sum that you want to construct which is going up till ten to the power six. So tell me one thing: if I construct a DP state like this, DP of uh, you know basically i or dp of x comma comma let's say k meaning that x is the sum that you want to construct and k was the uh, or basically you know you you're saying that um, you've picked up you've picked up coins in a in a way such that uh, your current sum is equal to x current sum uh, current sum is equal to x and last picked up coin was k what I'm saying is that you're not considering which is the basically. Let's say if you have uh, four coins, ten, comma five, comma twelve, comma four. I am saying your DP state is something like this: DP of x comma ten. Look at this thing. We have this. We have these denominations: ten, comma five, comma twelve, comma four. If I am considering my DP state as like this, that x is the sum that I that I've constructed so far, and ten, ten is the last picked up coin. So tell me one thing: Is constructing a DP state like this better, or constructing a DP state like DP of x comma the index of the coin, index of coin? Should we consider the actual value of coin or the index of coin? I want to understand this. Which is better? Why the index? Because the index is going up till index is going up till hundred, but the coin value, the coin value is going going up till ten to the power six. So it's obviously better to consider the index, right? Also, uh, somebody saying because of the memory, also the memory, and again the time as well. So you will see that how you know this is a better DP state. DP of x comma i. I have two DP states, okay? DP of x comma i, and let me just write it on subline. It would be much better. I'm sorry. So I think I should just remove this part. Okay. So you have DP of I am talking about two states, DP of x comma i, uh, meaning uh, sum so far is equal to x, and last big coin was the coin at index i, and I have DP of x comma k, and I'm saying sum so far is equal to x, and last big coin was k. I am saying the actual value of the coin was k, right? So tell me one thing in this in this DP of x comma i. If I know that you know my coins are in a sorted order, okay, I'm assuming that my coins are uh, stored in a sorted order now. If I'm saying that this was the last picked up coin, what are the possibilities that I have for pick picking up the next coin? Can you please repeat it once? Yeah, sure. So I am saying that there are two types of DP state. One of the state is DP of x comma i, meaning that the sum so far is equal to x, and this is nothing but number of ways to make final. Sum is equal to like bigger x, the the x that is given to us in the problem. This is one DP state, and this is the second DP state when we are considering the actual value of the coin. So which is better here? Like, is the index of the coin better or is the value of the coin better? Consider two ways. If I'm saying the index, let's say I'm picking up the ith coin. Tell me how many possibilities that I have for picking up the next coin. If you have picked up i as the last coin, you have two possibilities. Either you pick up Ith coin again. Either you pick up Ith coin again, or you just move here. Is this making sense? 
somebody saying four choices, not four choices actually. Uh, you just have two choices. Either you pick up ith coin again. Let's say you pick up ith coin again. What will happen? You will say dp of x comma i is equal to what? You will add you will add the denomination of i, right? So you will say x plus coins of i, and you will still say it is i only. The previous picked up coin was i only. Right. This is this is one thing. The second is that you don't pick up the ith coin. Now you move to the next coin. But tell me, when you're moving to the next coin, are you picking it up? Am I saying you're picking it up, or are you just leaving the ith coin? These are two different things. Picking up the ith i plus one ith coin, or just leaving the ith coin. What are we doing? We are just leaving the ith coin. We are not saying that we have picked up the i plus one ith coin. There could be cases where we don't want to pick up the i plus one ith coin. So we can say that the next condition is just keep the sum as x only because we haven't picked up anything. But you move your pointer from i to i plus one. Saying that you can now pick up coins from i plus one only. The, yes, the coins are in the sorted order. So that's a good question actually. When you read the problem statement, the coins that are given to you are not actually in the sorted order, but you can first sort them. If you sort them, this condition will always hold that if you are picking up the next coin, it will be larger than the previously picked up coins. Right. So tell me, how many choices do you have when you are saying dp of x comma i, i being the index of the coin? You have two choices. Right now, consider this thing. When you have dp of x comma k, what will happen here? When you are saying that k was the last picked up coin, what will happen here? First, in the array of the coins, you will have to go and search for k. Where is this k lying? You don't know what is the index of that coin, right? So first, you'll have to go in this coins array and you will see which is the coin whose value is equal to k. So what is the time complexity to search like this in an array, which is a sorted, which is a sorted array? Searching for k in a sorted coins array. What is the time complexity? Log n. That's a good. That's a good answer. So the the can you see that just in order to transition from one state to another, I will have to first of all search this. So can I say that the transition time here would be log n time, order of log n? <coughs> because now first of all you will search for k, and then you will say now you have two possibilities, right? The possibilities remain the same in the previous state and in the next state. The possibility, hmm. the possibilities remain same, but for searching this k, you will have to log in time. Hmm. Hello. Hello. Right. Hmm. So, is this clear to everyone? Like, how dp of x comma i is better than dp of x comma k? Give me a yes or a no in the chat. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So, I think we're going good now. So, tell me what is the transition now? Dp of x comma i is what? Nothing but dp of the first thing is to pick up the i ith coin again which is x plus coins of i and the coin remains same which is i the second state is nothing but dp of x the sum remains the same but you increase the index of the coin because now you're considering the i plus one coin so is this correct this part so i think the transition is clear the state is clear what else do we need so what is the fourth step process that i had told you guys how do how do we solve dp problems what is the next step to solve this problem now we had the state we had the transition then we had the third step we have the third step what is the third step we have four steps to solve a dp problem correct we have to look at the base case so somebody saying final sub problem final sub problem is the fourth step so what is the base case if i say that i have already reached i have some x i mean x is the actual value given to us in the problem statement x is the bigger x and let's say I have some uh, coin. I mean, it could be any arbitrary i. Let's say I tell you that x is equal to equal to uh, n, or sorry, not this x. Let's say this is the smaller x. Basically, we have this dp of x comma i. I could be any arbitrary i, but I'm saying that x is equal to the bigger x that is given to us in the problem statement, like this x that we want to construct. What is this dp of x comma i when x is equal to that x that we want to construct? Do we have any more ways to do it, or should this be one? Like when I'm telling you to construct x, uh, when I'm telling you to construct, let's say ten, and you have already reached dp of ten comma something like ten comma two. What should this be? You have already reached the end. Do you have any more possibilities here? If you reach the end, this should be one, right? Because there is just one way to construct it now. Similarly, tell me one thing: what will be dp of ten comma five if five was the last picked up coin? What will this be? This will also be one because we've already reached the end that we want to reach. Now tell me one thing: if I reach a farther value, like if I reach let's say twelve, twelve comma five, I want to I wanted to construct ten, but I reached twelve. 
So how many ways are there to construct 10 now? Zero, right. So you guys get the idea, right, of the base case. If x is equal to the actual value that you wanted to construct, the, the base case is one. And if you exceeded that value, the base case is what? Zero. Now, what is the final sub-problem? What is the final sub-problem? This is a trick question now. Like this is this is not so so obvious. What is the final sub-problem? Where are we starting this entire process from? Okay. You have like you have certain value. You want to get to n or you want to get to basically x, right? So I told you that dp of x comma any arbitrary i, this is equal to what? This is equal to one. I have given you the base case. So this process is like this, right? The states would be evaluated in this manner, starting from the suffix and like this. So our final sub problem will lie here. dp of what? Zero comma zero. Because, because what? Your current sum is zero when you're starting the problem. Your current sum is zero and the coin that you should start from should be zero, right? You should start from the very first coin itself. Right, so is this making sense that like this base case dp of x comma i, like i being anything is equal to what is equal to one and dp of any number greater than x comma i, this is equal to zero. But where are you, start, where are, what do you actually want to find out? You want to find out the number of ways to get to x when you are starting with a sum of zero. That's the, that's the problem statement, right? So you're saying dp of zero, zero is the sum that you're starting from. And zero is what? Zero is the first coin that you're standing at. This is the index of the coin. So is this clear guys? Uh, like this entire problem, the state, the transition, the base case and the final sub problem. Yes or no? Okay, perfect. Let's, let's update it in the slide so that you guys have an idea later on. So what I'm saying is you have here, you have DP of, let's, let's make it K comma I, okay? k comma i is equal to, um, this implies current sum is equal to k and standing at ith coin. Number of ways to make sum is equal to x. Is the state clear to everyone? We have already made a sum of k. We are standing at the ith coin. And now we want to find out the number of ways to make a sum of x, right? What is the transition? The transition is dp of k comma i is equal to dp of k plus coins at coins at i. This remains same plus dp of k comma i plus one. Is this right? The transition. You are standing at the ith coin. Either you can use it or you cannot use it. If you don't use it, what does that mean? That means that you have to shift to the next coin now. What what are we doing here? Tell me this, if you are standing at some coin, if you're standing at an index of a coin, let's say this one, am I not saying that just pick up coin, this coin as many times as you, as you want, but once you leave it, you should go to this coin. This is what I'm saying, right? That if let's say the value is four, if- And uh, then they basically okay. have no problem, you know, setting up and problem. So- Yeah, sorry. I think there was somebody who unmuted, but anyway. So can you see that what I'm saying in this problem? I am saying that if you're standing at this point and if this denomination is four, then pick up four as many times as you want in this in this like problem. But once you leave four, you should now move to five. You should not pick up four ever again. So this is what we're doing. When you're standing at the i ith coin, either you pick it up. If you're picking it up, you add that to your sum. If you if you're not picking it up, then you move to the next coin. What are the base cases? So first of all, dp of x comma i any arbitrary i is equal to one dp of uh, any value greater than greater than x comma i is equal to zero and there is un, one more condition which is that dp of any number let's say it could be any number y comma comma n let's say we exhausted all the coins what happens then if we exhausted all the coins and we never reach to our sum what is what are the number of ways then zero right cool so base case is fine. And what is the final sub problem? Where are we starting from? Where are we starting from? Yep, perfect. TP of zero comma zero. Right. So I think this, I didn't get the final sub problem. Let's talk about it again. 
So look at this. What what is our DP state? Our state was x comma i, which means that your standing your current sum is x. Or basically, let keep it like k, okay? Because then you then it will make more sense. DP of k comma i. It means that your standing at uh, ith point we have till now constructed a sum of k. So what is our state dependent upon? DP of k plus points at i comma i plus DP of k comma i plus one. This this is clear, right? The state and the transition. If the state and the transition is clear, if you look at the base uh, base case, base case is like if you reach the end, if you reach the x, then the number of ways are one. So can you see that this is the order we are evaluating the state? First, we are evaluating the state for x. Then we are evaluating the state for x minus one. Then we are evaluating the state of x minus two. Why am I saying this? Do you understand that the states of x minus two will be dependent on the states of x minus one from this transition? DP of k is dependent on DP of k plus one, right? Or I mean, not k plus one, but uh, basically later, later states, right? So can I say that I have to evaluate the states in this manner? So where 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 will I where will I where will my final answer lie? Will it not lie at, at this index when you're starting from this point? You've already evaluated all of this. You came here. Now this is the point that your final answer will lie at. Okay, perfect. Now let's move to the second problem. So I hope the first problem is clear to everyone. And did you guys learn something from this problem? What what did you guys learn from this problem? Any learnings that you had, you can mention them in the chat. Okay, did you see that we actually twisted the problem a little? Uh, somebody saying backward DP, okay. Somebody saying that how to go for problems that require the dependency of order. Yeah, that is something that you learn. Like if you see DP of X comma I, it is dependent on what? It is dependent on later states, like X plus something. X plus something, it is dependent on these states. So you know that the order in which you are evaluating the states actually matters. Okay, somebody saying never thought about space optimization for this problem. That's a good point. That's a good point. What about space optimization? What did you guys think? Can we apply space optimization here? I am saying DP of X comma I is dependent on what states? It is dependent on DP of X plus points of I comma I and DP of X comma I plus one. Can I apply some space optimization here? When do we apply space optimization? We apply space optimization when we know that our current state, this current state, it is dependent on only a few states. But it is, is it only dependent on only a few states? Look at DP of X comma I. This X plus coins of I could be any arbitrary value, right? You don't know what is the value of coins I. It could be any arbitrary value. So we cannot do space optimization here. Exactly. So it depends on like some arbitrary states. We don't know which states we can disregard. When we are calculating DP of X, X comma I, can I say that some DP state we can disregard? Some later DP state? I cannot say that, right? So if I cannot say that, then there cannot be any space optimization here. So, but that was a good point. I mean, at least we thought about it. That, that's really commendable. So now let's talk about another problem, another problem here. And I'll give you, I think, 20 seconds to like think about it again, because since this was a homework problem. So in this problem, you have a bookshop which sells n different books. You know the price and the number of pages of each book. You have decided that the total price of your purchases will be at max X. What is the maximum number of pages you can buy? You can buy each book at most once. Right, so think about this problem. What you have is this, you have n shop. You have n shops. This is like let's say the array of prices, and this is the price. Uh, this is like let's say the cost. This is the cost array of each book, and this is let's say the pages array of each book. Okay. So they've told you that you can pick up any book at most once. Like if you picked up this book, you can never pick it up again. But what happens here when you pick up this book? 
you first of all have to spend this much cost let's say the first 10 rupees and the pages that it was providing was two rupees or uh, two pages so you will have to spend from your x x is the limit that you can spend you have to spend x minus 10 but your final value will become what value plus equal to 2 right so this is what is happening you want to find out the maximum number of pages you can read right so think about this problem look at the constraints the constraints should give you an idea of the dp state that you can make for each book you have a choice either you can pick it up or you leave it can we do it in a similar way to previous problem but add a restriction that one book can only be picked up only can only be picked up once that's right that's right yeah you're thinking in the right direction think about it more give me a state that is what i want give me a state that model some sub problem Okay, let's talk about it in this way. Let's say you consider these n books, right? Let's say you consider these books and you have already processed this part of the array. You've already, you know, decided which book do you want to pick up in these three books and which books do you want to leave? What do you think are the parameters that will define my state now? like when i'm standing here what is the information that I that i should have when i when i've already you know like made my choices for these three books what are the i mean what what should i be storing so that i know i mean i am able to represent some sub problem how many money have you spent already that's a good point but should you also know how much page how many pages have you picked up yeah you should know that i mean that could be one state right that you're standing at dp of i you are standing at the ir index you have spent up uh, spent how much money you spent let's say j money and you have uh, been able to read k pages this could be one state right what i'm saying is this dp of um, dp of i from a j and let's like move it to the next page dp of i or let's say index uh, money spent uh pages are read is equal to what uh maximum pages you can read uh in the suffix because you've already what you already spent uh, i mean you already decided on the prefix right what are the pages you've picked up uh, i mean what are the books that you've picked up what is the money that you've spent and what are the number of pages that you've read right so maximum pages you can read in the suffix if you've done this much this could be one state right okay what is the transition what are the two choices that i have for the book uh, book at index i mean at our current index let's say this is the book that i'm concerned about now what happens here what are the two choices that i have for this book will i not say index plus 1 like basically dp of index comma or let's just call it dp of i comma j comma k now you guys get the idea what is i j k is equal to first of all you will increase your index because now you are going to the next book there are two possibilities either you pick up your current book or you leave it let's say you pick it up let's say you say j plus uh, j plus cost of cost of i and let's say you say k plus um k plus what k plus pages of i this could be one state when you are saying when you are saying you you know what uh, just uh, just pick up this book the other state could be you don't pick up this book so what happens to your cost will the cost change and will the number of pages change they will not change if you are not picking it up right 
but what do i what do i want i want the maximum of, maximum of both of these possibilities right i want to read the maximum number of pages so what will i do what will be my equation the maximum of the two right okay perfect so i can say max this this could be one state what is the base case now let's say i reach the end let's say i reach index n and i've spent some cost j some some pages i've read k what will this be if i tell you that if uh, you know if j is greater than j is greater than x that was allowed what do you think is the number of pages i can read in that case like if j exceeds the cost that i picked up so far exceeds the value that i was allowed can i read any pages here then all the pages that i picked up will will go to waste right so i'll say in this case it is in this case it is zero but otherwise if the cost is less than equal to x what happens then i just return k because k is the number of pages i've read so far right perfect so what will be your final sub problem you have a state you have a transition you have a base case now what about the final sub problem you are starting from the zero uh, basically the zero uh, index of the books you have spent zero money and you've read you've read zero pages right so tell me the time complexity here so you have these values right n is the number of coins so you have uh, sorry not number of coins but number of books so you have n into uh, j is the cost that is allowed so that will be x right x and what is k k is the number of pages you've read how much uh, you know how much big can k be like uh, the number of pages in the book can be up till 1000 and you have a thousand books so this could go up till 10 to the power 6 right so it is like n into x into 10 to the power 6 this will be the time complexity this is what this is what this is something like 1000 into x is going up till 10 to the power 5 and you have another 10 to the power 6 this will be the time complexity and this is is this a good good way to solve this problem that's the question like will this work 1000 into 10 to the power 5 into 10 to the power 6 this, this is just huge it is very very slow so this will give you a time limit exceeded and also a memory limit exceeded the time limit the time complexity and the space complexity both will be same in this problem if you are not doing any uh, any what any what do you say space optimization so is this a good state that is what i want to know from you guys is this state a good state great so up until now you guys would have seen that we were not talking about this concept of a good state we were only saying that get a state get a transition get a base case and then get a final sub problem but is that enough that's the question is it enough to find out any state any state that works is it enough it is not enough so what you want to do is find out a good state okay so that's where the actual thinking part comes into the picture that's where your experience will come into the picture right now i have given you a given you a proper way to solve this problem but i mean i mean pro, a pro, proper way to solve any dp problem but what but you don't know how to think of a good state so how do you think of a good state that will come with experience so i can give you a state now as this dp of i comma j being a uh, number of pages you can read Uh, just a minute. Number of pages you can read from uh, books zero, so on up till i, such that you are allowed to spend j points. What about this DP state? Does this DP state uh, like? Uh, in the uh, can you yeah. show the previous state? Oh right, sure. Yeah. So here, uh, like you have taken k as a parameter. that is the pages that are read but like isn't k itself the quantity that you are maximizing then why did we choose it as a parameter that's a good point so in this next state that you've seen uh, that you're seeing here am i choosing k as a parameter yes yeah, so like this this is the optimized one mm -hmm. yeah exactly so i am trying to tell you how to think of a good state here like i am giving you a good state here and i'm also telling you that not all the states that you think about will be good states so you were able to catch it pretty quickly that why should we even store this k 
when we are when we are only returning it at the end why should we even store it that's a good point that is something that you were able to think about but if i give you this problem as a completely new problem a lot of people might think about this problem in this way that you are standing on the ith index the money spent you know about and the pages you've read so far right so there are a lot of ways to solve any dp problem all you have to do is think of a good way like you have you have to think of a good state and now like i'm giving when i'm giving you the state this is not like uh, i am giving you the state out of some uh, i mean i'm not giving you the state because i only already know the answer i am giving you the state because i have a lot of experience and i know and i know what type of states will work here right so this will come with experience don't worry when i'm giving you a state so quickly right now this this you will also be able to do after good enough practice fine so now tell me if this state looks good enough dp of ij being the number of pages you can read from book 0 to i such that you are allowed to spend j coins also you know somebody in the chat mentioned when we gave this problem that this is a knapsack problem so let me tell you one more thing whenever you are you know talking about dynamic programming uh, it is a good it is a good strategy to relate uh, your current problem to previous problems but again you should never try to memorize things here okay never try to memorize like this was how i called knapsack it it makes no sense if you are trying to relate your current problem to the knapsack problem that's like a good thing but never try to memorize anything that's what i'm saying always try to make it a point that you should be able to think of good states on spot fine that should be your aim not not trying to memorize as many dp problems so tell me a transition for uh, for this problem if i'm saying dp of ij being the number of pages you can read from book 0 to i such that you are allowed to spend j coin so what happens here i am saying that this is the array of books you are at the is book and you are saying dp of i comma i comma j so tell me one thing what are the possibilities that you have for the book i either you can read it or you can not read it right so let's say i consider this possibility uh, not reading is book can i say that dp of i j will be nothing but dp of i minus 1 comma j what i'm saying is that you have been given a cost of j but you're not reading the ith book so what i'm saying is that you know just look at the books that you've read from 0 to i minus 1 and if i give you a cost of j then tell me how many pages can you read right and if i let's say tell you that you're reading the ith book what happens here how will your cost change if you're looking at the previous index would you not say i minus 1 comma j minus uh points of or basically cost of i and you will also add the number of pages you are reading uh, you are reading here so you'll say pages of i plus this tell me if this transition makes sense when we are saying dp of i being the number of pages you can read from book 0 to i such that you are allowed to spend j coins you have two possibilities either you read the ith book or you don't read it if you read the ith book you add the pages that you've read but you also subtract the cost that you could now that is now allowed in the i minus 1 i minus 1 book fine so what will be the final sub problem obviously like you will be considering the max of two cases consider the max of two cases what will be the final sub problem look at the problem statement what does the problem statement tell you it tells you that you have n books and you are allowed a allowed a cost of x point right so what will be your final sub problem dp of okay somebody saying dp of 0 comma 0 now if you are saying dp of 0 comma 0 tell me what dp of 0 comma 0 means so parth has written dp of 0 comma 0 what dp of 0 comma 0 means dp of 0 comma 0 according to this definition will mean dp of 0 comma 0 is equal to number of pages you can read from book what 0 to 0 such that you are allowed a cost of 0 is that the problem statement is this the problem statement it is not right but is dp of n comma x the problem statement replace n comma x in in this equation and you will see if this makes sense right 
so again i think when you mentioned dp of 0 comma 0 you not again you know thinking from the perspective that i am thinking right you trying to sort of relate problems to the previous problems like if you look at the last problem our final sub problem was dp of 0 comma 0 but the final sub problem really depends on how you are defining the state it is not something that remains constant for every problem like i told you your uh, final sub problem depends on two things you're saying final sub problem it depends on two things first is the problem statement and second is the way you define the state okay so i hope this makes sense now and what will be the base case dp of 0 comma or we can say dp of minus 1 comma anything will be zero basically if i'm not allowed to pick up any books if i'm allowed to pick up books from 0 to minus 1 what will that mean that will mean that i'm not allowed to pick up any books and if i have any any uh, you know any cost available will i be able to pick up any books will i be able to read any pages that will be the base case right look at this transition and see where it fails okay so is this fine is this clear to everyone guys this is the base case okay tell me one thing is dp of minus 1 defined is minus 1 like a you know thing that you can even represent in in an array index so tell me one thing if instead of considering this as minus 1 if i increase the i i mean if, if i increase the first dimension by 1 in every case and it should be like n minus 1 actually like since we are considering zero based indexing in the previous problem this should be n minus 1 dp of n minus 1 comma x right i, I hope this makes sense right this final the problem this should not be dp of n comma x but dp of n minus 1 comma x right what i'm saying is that if, if minus 1 is not defined then just increase increase the first parameter in all states by one. Will this be fine now? If I increase the first parameter by one in every state, then my final sub problem will change from what? DP of n minus one comma x to what? DP of, I mean, think about it like this. This transition remains same, but DP final sub problem will be what? DP of n comma x. And base case will be what? DP of zero comma anything will be zero, right? Uh, so yeah, I hope this. Yeah, go on. Uh, in the base case, uh, should we also add the conditions when the uh, j becomes less than zero? Like if we subtract the cost. Uh, and okay, that's a good point. Later. That's a good point. Tell me one thing: Can you ever read the ith book if the available cost is? less than the cost of your current book. Can you read the IS book in that case? When J is greater than or equal to cost of I. Right. So I, I thought this was obvious, but uh, just in case this was not, then you can only read the IS book if its cost is less than or equal to the cost that is allowed to you. Right. So if I maintain this condition that reading the ith book only when this happens, then can I say that J will never become less than zero? Any DP state will never like get into a state where the this, this second parameter becomes parameter becomes less than zero. Can you explain base case again? Okay. So understand it this way. We defined our problem statement in this way. We uh, or basically we defined a state in this way. Number of pages you can read from book zero comma zero to i such that you're allowed to spend J coin. But when can you not read books? If you're standing on the zeroth book, that is the first book actually, considering zero based indexing. If you're standing on the zeroth book, can you read the book? Tell me this. Are you allowed to read the book or are you not allowed to read the book? When you're standing at the zeroth book, which is actually the first book when, you, when we talk about one based indexing. Can you read the zeroth book? According to this, this state. You can read it, right? So that's not a base case, but can you read books when you, when there are no books available to you? And how do you represent it? That would be represented by minus one here. Like in this, in the way that we've defined a state here, it will, it will be like minus one. 
because okay tell me this number of books from 0 to 0 what is this and tell me number of books from 0 to minus 1 what do you what do you think is this this value number of books uh, starting from 0 to 0 this is one but number of books starting from 0 to minus 1 these are these are uh, zero you don't have any books in that in that range so that's the base case actually but when i said dp of minus 1 comma anything you are not allowed to store minus 1 in an array index this this does not mean anything so in order to prevent this what i'm saying is that increase the first parameter in all states by just one so your final the problem is just change from n uh, n minus 1 comma x to n comma x and your base case will change from 0 minus 1 comma anything to 0 comma anything there will be one more change which will be in the transition which will be this when you are reading the ias book and when you are reading the ias book what will you say you are you are actually reading the i plus sorry i minus 1 book right so what will i say i'll say dp of i comma j is equal to pages of i minus 1 uh, you remember last time we said pages of i because we were saying ias book itself but since we are increasing the first parameter by one in every state we will not be reading the ias book we will be actual uh, we will actually be reading the i minus 1 book right so we'll say dp of i minus 1 comma j minus cost of cost of i or cost of i minus 1 cost of i or cost of i minus 1 i minus 1 perfect so now i think you guys get the idea right so let's just write it here our state is let me close this dp of um, i comma j is equal to um, max pages you can read when allowed to read the first i books and given cost is and allowed cost is j okay transition is dp of i comma j is equal to maximum of dp of i minus 1 comma j when you are not checking up the ith book and pages of i minus 1 plus uh, dp of i minus 1 uh, comma j minus cost uh, of i minus um yes in the state uh, shouldn't we change it to first i minus 1 books um first i minus 1 book okay let's say i tell you that uh, you know dp of 1 comma something 1 comma 10 what does this represent are you reading zero books here or are you reading one book here one book so would you say i minus 1 books or would you say i books i okay so that's what i've written what is the base case the base case is dp of 0 comma anything is what this is what when you are not allowed to read any books what is the number of pages you can read in that case zero perfect so this is zero what is the final sub problem dp of n comma n comma x x was the parameter given to us in the problem okay now there is one more question that i have for you guys tell me this uh, you know we transitioned from doing something like dp of i mostly we were in the last two classes we were mostly doing something like dp of i right now we are also doing something like dp of i comma j tell me one thing uh, did you guys find it difficult to go from i to i comma j or was it kind of obvious like how difficult was it on a scale of 1 to 10 going from i to i comma j somebody is saying it was not difficult not really okay somebody saying 7 so when you say 7 do you mean that it was very difficult for, for you to go from dp of i to dp of i comma j like going from something like a 1 ddp to a 2 ddp somebody saying 5 comma 10 okay so the actual idea that i want you guys to have here is that it's it doesn't really matter if you have i or if you have i comma j or if you have i comma j comma k so yeah it would be a little difficult that's fine but tell me one thing is it bet, is it better to discuss like this is 1 ddp this is 2 ddp this is 3 ddp and then let's say some day i give you a 5 ddp is it is it better to discuss all of these differently or is it like great to just discuss all of them together and treat it like a normal general state which is better 
Correct. Somebody saying together. That's that's right. You should try to study all of these together. It's not like you should be you know studying one DDP first and then study two DDP, then study three DDP. It doesn't make sense. Trust me. If if somebody can solve a one DDP problem, they can also solve a three DDP problem. If if they know how to represent a state. In this entire series of lectures, I will never be telling you that this is a three DDP. This is a two DDP. Because these are terms just made up by people. We don't need these terms to actually solve a DP problem, right? So there was one person who had also asked this problem, which was like, uh, you know, bottom up or top down. Have you guys heard about these terms, bottom up, top down? Have you guys heard about these terms, bottom up DP, top down DP? Okay. So did I ever talk about these terms in these three lectures that we've done so far? Bottom up, top down, anything like this? We never talked about it. Is it important? That's the question. Is it important which states are you evaluating first? Like uh, knowing is it bottom up or is it top down, or does just the flow of states matter to you? These are the two questions. This is the question that I have. There are two choices: the flow of states. This is one thing, and the second thing is jargons. What is important? Is knowing a lot of jargons important, or is knowing the flow of state important? Will will knowing that you know this this problem can be solved using a bottom up DP help you to solve it? Will this ever help you? It will not help you. But will will this help you? That if I give you the flow of state, can you can you solve the problem with the flow of state? Will it give you some hint? It will give you some hint. A bottom up, a top down, or you know some spiral DP, it doesn't make sense. Okay. So a key takeaway from this session should be that you should not try to learn. Dynamic programming in a way that you segregate everything out. Okay, as far as concepts are concerned, like space optimization, state optimization, transition optimization, these are kind of like different concepts. So we cover them differently. But it is not a good practice to, you know, solve different DP problems with a different approach, with a different mindset. You should always have a single mindset when you're solving a DP problem, which is to follow that four-step process. Which is the hardest part in those in those four steps? The state. The transition, the base case, or the final sub problem, which is the hardest part. The hardest part is the state, and it's not just the state. What do we need? We need a good state. You, you guys would have seen in the problem that we solved just now. Any state does not work. Having a good state works, right? So, this is the most difficult part, and this will come with experience. This is the only part that will come with experience. Okay, this finding a good state. The transition is very simple. It is like you know you have a sub problem. You represent it in terms of other sub problem. Once you know what you mean by the state, like I said in this entire in these in, in all of these sessions, it is very important for you to for you to understand what is the meaning of a state. Because if you understand the meaning of a state, the transition follows automatically. Similarly, if you get a good transition, the base case follow follows automatically because base case is the point where the transition fails, and then the final sub problem. So the final sub problem is also a, is also kind of a difficult task for most of the beginners. Why is this a difficult task? Because most of us have been taught DP in a way that you, you just memorize all the states, you just memorize all the transitions, and then the final sub problem could be something like zero comma zero. It could be something like n comma x, i comma j comma k. It could be any random stuff. But that is not how it works. The final sub problem is dependent on two things. The first is the problem statement. What is it asking you? What is the problem statement asking you? And how have you defined your state? So whenever you you know think of a problem, uh, whenever you think of a final sub problem, if you have a state, you will have a definition for that state. Try replacing those parameters in the state in the definition of the state. Let's say somebody tells you that DP of n comma x will be the final sub problem. Don't listen to them. Just replace this n comma x in the definition of your state and see if it matches what the problem statement requires from you. If it matches, then you've got the right final sub problem. If it does not, it does not. Uh, it is not the right final sub problem. Fine. So, is this part clear to all of you? Can we move ahead now? State is sort of a proof, also. Um, not sure what you mean by that, but state is kind of the most important part, and you should clearly define what you mean by the state. I am going to stress upon this a lot of times, and I get really mad when you know people come up to me and tell me. That you have DP of i comma j comma k, and this is the transition. And I'm like, what do you mean by DP of i comma j comma k? What does it represent? And they have no idea. 
the like we solved a problem earlier it was somehow related to it and now we know that this would be the state it would be a 3d dp they come up and tell me this this stuff it it would be a 3d dp it would be a 4d dp and i'm like you don't know about the state what is the state if you don't know the state saying that 2d 3d 4d it's all it's all nonsense okay so yeah cool now let's talk about the third problem so this is the problem statement given to us uh, you know that an array has n integers between 1 and m so all the integers are going from 1 to m and the absolute difference between uh, two adjacent values is at most 1 given a description of the array where some values may be unknown your task is to count the number of arrays that match the description okay so what the given in the problem statement is this okay one more thing uh, in this problem statement uh, what are we trying to do what type of a problem is this are we trying to minimize or maximize something are we trying to check for possibility or are we trying to find out the number of ways look at the problem statement number of ways correct perfect so i think i i told you this in the first lecture that you have like four to five categories of dp and there are like some type of problems that you can solve with it so it's also important to understand what is the what is the type of problem that you solving so if let's say you are solving for number of ways if you are solving for number of ways can you solve it using greedy can you ever solve a problem with finding the number of ways using a greedy approach why because greedy is like considering just one of these ways good one more type of problem is finding the maximum or the minimum of a particular value can you use greedy here in this type of a problem finding the maximum or a, i mean trying to maximize or minimize certain values so the main confusion between greedy and dp comes in this type of a problem statement greedy versus dp you have to minimize or maximize certain value this is the only place where you have a conflict between greedy and dp okay and this will this will also come with experience how do you figure out whether it will be a greedy problem or whether it will be like a dp problem so there will be one trick that i will be sharing in i think lecture 4 or lecture 5 and this trick is going to help you in context so like whenever you're trying to solve a very theoretical problem this trick might not help you but when you're trying to attempt like a code forces round or a code chef round this trick is going to help you in deciding between greedy and dp you will be able to like figure out whether you can solve this problem using dp or not within just 10 seconds using that trick and you will not have to spend a lot of time uh, in a lot of you know bad greedy approaches okay so i think that should be like a good motivation to attend that fifth or i guess the fourth lecture but yeah talking about this problem this is what is required you have an array and then there are certain values uh, i mean the array values could go from 1 to m let's consider m to be 10 okay 1 to 10 you can take the values from 1 to 10 so some values are uh, you know purposely made zero zero being that you don't know what is the value there so let's say i tell you that the actual array is something like 3 comma 0 comma uh, 4 and then you have let's say a 6 the condition is that any two adjacent elements should have a difference of less than equal to 1 okay so raj that's like a good uh, thing that you written that the that sometimes the constraints are very small and it is better to pick up a greedy so it is better to pick up a dp approach than a greedy approach so that's kind of the trick that i would be talking about but i would give you a more formal way to you know approach problems but yeah that's a good that's a good point that's exactly how we differentiate between greedy and dp mostly in context right so the in this problem statement it's written that you have an array you have to fill up these values of zero you don't know what is the value that uh, you know i mean there could be a lot of different values that you can put at these indices so you have to figure out the number of ways you can fill this array such that any two adjacent ele elements differ by at max one so tell me for this this particular index can i fill it with six can i fill this index with a six no why because 6 minus 4 will become greater than 1 can i fill this with a 2 can i fill this index with a 2 no but can i fill this index with a 4 and can i fill this index with a 3 okay perfect so you guys get the idea a little bit like for every every element you have a choice right every place where there is a zero you have a choice you can put any number that you want to 
but the condition is that it should be what? Okay, one more thing. Difference, yeah. The condition is that the difference should be less than equal to one. One more thing is this. Let's say, you know, I am considering this. So let's say, you know, the value field here was three. The value field here was four. And now let's say I'm standing here and this element actually contains a zero right now. So tell me one thing, if I make my DP state as something like this, DP of I, being number of ways you can fill this prefix. How would you solve this problem? DP of I being the number of ways you can fill this prefix from, you know, zero comma zero to I. How would you go about it? Are we storing the entire information that we need in this DP state? Or do we need some more information to, to fill up this, to fill up this element? The zero. Are we not uh, concerned about what was the element that was, you know, inserted at the previous index? When I say that DP of I is the number of ways to fill the prefix uh, of this array from zero to I. Okay, somebody is saying we also need to care about the next element. But tell me about the DP state. What I'm saying is that you need to fill up this prefix. You want to make sure that this part is correct. This part, this entire part is actually correctly filled. If I want to just make sure about this prefix, do I care about this suffix? My DP state is saying that I want to just care about making this prefix a good prefix. I am not concerned about the complete array. So Krishnam, when you're saying that, um, this is one more thing that I've seen in a lot of people, which is that when they are looking at a DP state, they're trying to, even when they're, you know, solving a smaller sub problem, they're looking at a bigger sub problem. So if I'm telling you that you only want to solve for this prefix, this is the sub problem that you're solving. Are you concerned about this element? If this is your sub problem. Okay, let's, let's talk about this. This is actually very interesting. Uh, when I say that you have n, n being dependent on n minus two, and let's say something like n minus three. When you are solving for n minus three, when we are solving for, sorry, when we are solving for n minus two, are we concerned about n? My question is this. If n is a sub problem and n minus two is a sub problem and n minus three is a sub problem, if I'm solving for n minus two, am I concerned about n? So that's another key takeaway from the session. When you're solving a sub problem, when you're solving a sub problem, don't think about bigger sub problems. If you're solving this problem, give your entire focus to this problem. Don't think about what is here because that is not in our, that is not in our scope. Right? So perfect. So when you're solving a sub problem, I mean, this, this is actually a very, you know, genuine concern. This is actually a very genuine confusion in a lot of people that when I'm saying I'm only considering this prefix, what about this element? What happened to this element? When are we, when are we going to consider this element? And my answer is that when I'm saying DP of I, there will also be some DP of I plus one, right? I am not leaving that out. There will be a state. There will be a sub problem to include this element as well. I'm not leaving it out com completely. But right now when I'm talking about this sub problem, I don't care about this, right? So that's the thing now. You have this array. You want to fill this array till this index I. So now are we concerned about this element? If you want to fill up this part, we're not concerned about this element. But now when we're trying to solve this sub problem, how do I represent it in terms of smaller sub problem? What will be a smaller sub problem? If I'm saying DP of I, can I say that DP of I minus one will be a smaller sub problem? Can I say this? DP of I being the number of ways to fill this array till, till this index and I minus one will, will, be, till, uh, will be about filling till this index. So can I say that DP of I minus one will be a smaller sub problem? Okay, so how do you how do you relate DP of I to DP of I minus one? Is there some information that you are missing out on? How do you relate it to DP of I minus one? Taking the previous element. Exactly. So when 
when we are trying to relate dp of i to dp of i minus 1 i will have to fill up something here right that is only how i will be able to relate dp of i to dp of i minus 1 so can i fill up any any element here if the last element was 2 can i fill up 5 here we cannot so is there some information that we are missing out on could we not know what was the last element that was inserted here somebody saying dp of i is equal to dp of i minus 1 plus n n is the number of ways to fill i but how do you know about i what are the number of ways to fill i you also have to make sure of that i mean you have to make sure right that the adjacent elements are not same or i mean the adjacent elements are not uh, differing from each other by more than one so when you are filling up this index do you not need to know what was the element that was filled up earlier we are talking about this this array this sub array we should maintain another parameter to keep a check for previous element perfect that is what i wanted to know from you guys dp of i comma x x being the the element that was inserted previously so what are the number of ways here if x is the number if x is you know like uh, if x was the number inserted previously uh, what can you say here or basically can you say this like if you know that x was the number that was inserted previously can you say that your current element let's say you you putting your current element element as dp of i comma 10 that means your current element is going to be 10 let's try to not think about the previous parameter but let's try to think of the current element that we are inserting so tell me can in the previous element this is like the array or let's pick up another page sir yep sir what do we need to uh, maintain uh, previous two elements like as you said so we are defining the prefix like we are not hmm. when we are uh, seeing the state so we are not looking into the next element so right. suppose like uh, we are at state i dp of i and uh, previous element was 5 and we added a 6 after it hmm. on the ith element. But then hmm. in i plus 1 at element, uh, a 4 was already given. So then this 6 becomes wrong. So we will have to, uh, so when we are at 4, we will have to check like for pre, hmm. like if it is right or not previous. That's right. That's right. You're again going into that direction where we're talking about this element. Is this element important to me right now when we are trying to just fill up this this part? I want yeah, to know so, this. So what I'm saying is like when we go to the bigger sub problem that is including that element, mm -hmm. at that point we will we need to check the like if the previous one was that was entered was correct or not. That's right. But that will that we will take care of when we are solving the bigger sub problem, right? Why should we take care of that right now? Yes, in the bigger sub problem. So we'll we'll come to that. Don't don't worry. We'll come to that. Once you look at the state, you everything will fall into the picture. Okay. So what I'm saying is this. Let's define my state like this now. Dp of i comma x being number of ways to fill prefix till index i. This this part till here. Let's have one more index here such that last element, last element being the element that you're inserting at the ith element, ith index, or such that ith element is x. Can I define my dp state like this now? dp of i comma x being the number of ways such that number of ways you can fill the prefix till index i such that the ith element is x. Can I define my state like this now? Okay, perfect. So if I'm filling a, filling an X here, what are the possibilities that I have? If let's say this element was not X, this element was already given as Y. Can I fill this element as X now? If this was not a zero, but it was given a Y value and Y is not equal to X. Can I fill it with X? Can I fill this element with X? I cannot. Okay. So now you tell me this. If I'm saying dp of i comma x, what are the possibilities for the previous index? What can I fill at the previous index? Tell me this. I can fill x minus one, I can fill x, and I can fill what? What is the third value that I can fill at the previous element? 
if I filled up X here. What do you think? If I'm filling up an X here, what are the values that I can fill up at this index? Can I fill up a my, uh, can I fill up an X minus one here? At this element, if I have filled up an X here, this is X. Can I fill up an X minus one here in this point? Yes or no? I can fill up an X minus one. I can fill up an X and I can fill up an X plus one. So can I say, let's write a DP plate. DP of I comma X is equal to one number of ways to fill prefix till index I such that the ith element is X. So there is one condition which is that if A, if ARR of I is not equal to zero and then ARR of I is not equal to X, what, what happens here? What is DP of I comma X in this case? When the given value is not equal to X and it is not equal to zero. How many ways are there to fill up the prefix such that the last element is actually X? What do you think? The actual value in the array is not a zero and it is also not equal to X. So you cannot fill it with any other element than the actual value there. So can you fill it with an X? What happens in this case? What is DP of I comma X equal to in this case? DP of I comma X is equal to X. Then DP of I comma X is equal to what? X can be filled. You're saying X can be filled at the ith element. This is what I have. I am talking about this element, this element, this is actually filled up, filled up with a 10 and I want to fill it with a five. Can I fill it with a five if, if it is there, if 10 is already there? Right, right. So DP of I comma X will be zero. But if it is not equal to zero, I mean, if ARR of I is equal to zero or if ARR of I is equal to X, can I fill X there then? Can I put an X at this index if this is a zero? Or basically if this is an array and this is let's say a five, can I fill up, fill this index with a five? I can. If this index was a zero, can I fill this index with a five? I can. So in both of these cases, what will I say? I will say DP of I comma X is equal to what DP of I minus one. Like in the previous element, you fill up, fill that up with a X minus one or you fill that up with a I minus one comma X or you fill that up with a I minus one comma X plus one. Is this a correct transition? You're filling the ith element with the X. So what are the possibilities for the X minus one? -th? Understand it this way. What have you already processed? When I'm saying I am standing here, what have you already processed? You've processed this part. Have you processed the suffix or have you processed the prefix? That is my question. The prefix. So should your state be dependent on the prefix or should your state be dependent on the suffix? The prefix, right? The transition is clear. What about the final sub problem? Now this is okay. Even before the final sub problem, what is uh, the base case? I can just say, just look at the zeroth element. So there are two cases here. If uh, ARR of zero is equal, equal to zero, then what do you say? Then you can say DP of zero comma, any number, anything will be what? How many ways are there to fill up the first element if ARR of zero is equal to zero? How many ways are there to fill up the, just the first element? If you can fill it up with anything, it is one. If you can, if you want to fill it with, fill it up with a five, there is just one way. If you want to fill it up with a 10, there is just one way. Else, else you say that DP of zero comma anything is equal to zero, but DP of zero comma ARR of zero is equal to one. Is this fine? Look at the first element. If it is filled up with a zero, if that array uh, element is a zero, then you can fill it up with anything. So anything, if you fill, fill that up, there is just one way. Otherwise, if there is already a value present there, then you cannot fill it up with anything 
other than the value that is already present there. So is the base case fine? Final sub problem. This is going to be tricky now. What is the final sub problem? What is the final sub problem? Any ideas, any guesses? Perfect, perfect. Somebody has written DP of n comma one. How, how many ways are there to fill it up with a one? Plus DP of n comma two. How many ways are there to fill up the last index with a, with a element two and so on? Plus DP of n comma n. This is the final sub problem. Is this clear to everyone? Yes or no? That this will be the final sub problem. Considering all the elements from zero to n, uh, or basically this should actually be, you know what? This should actually be n minus one because there are, we're considering zero based indexing, right? So this should actually be n minus one. Okay. So I hope this is fine. What is the time complexity here? How many states are there? Number of states. Look at this. Number of states are n into n into m. M was the biggest value that was allowed. And how much time does it require to do you or to do one transition? How many steps are these? Are these order of one steps? Are these order of n steps? Or are these order of log n steps? What are these? Doing a transition. What is this part? Yeah, it's order of one. So time complexity is this space complexity is what according to this state what is the space complexity n into m can you optimize the space complexity look at this transition if I'm, if I let's say represent it in terms of a table, that it, this is like n, and this is x, then dp of i comma j is dependent on what? If you talk about all the dp states in this row, this ith row, they are only dependent on this row, right? This previous row. Are they dependent on this previous this row? Are the states of ith row dependent on the states of the i minus two th row? Look at this transition. Do you ever see like an i minus two or something like this here? You always have an i minus one. So can you do some space optimization uh, like we discussed in the last class? Yes, you can do a space optimization. So, I mean, that's, that's up to you. That's like a homework again. You'll have to do it. Like you'll have to code it up on your own. I mean, I'm not going to spoon feed you guys. So in case you don't know about space optimization, check out lecture two and it should make everything clear. So I think let's just try to replace these values here now. So the state is, let's copy this. Number of ways to fill prefix, to fill zero to i, such that i element is x. Transition is dp of, This is transition DP and base case is like this. So you can say if it is a zero, then you can say, um, or you can put it like this. Right, final sub problem will be DPO. 
n minus 1, comma 0. Fine, is this clear to everyone now? I hope you guys are able to understand this thing, this ternary operator kind of thing. Okay, so are we good to like, you know, move to next, uh, move to the, you know, future concepts or any doubts in these three problems that we've discussed so far? And yeah, you would have seen that we went from 1D DP to 2D to 2D DP without even talking about it. So yeah. Sir, uh, uh, in the final sub problem, uh, like okay, yeah, all of these uh, values like you have n, n minus one comma one, n minus one mm -hmm. comma two up till n minus one comma m. So uh, won't only three of these have some value and rest be zero, right? That's right. That's right. So, like, but no, 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 no. That's that's actually not right. What if I tell you that you fill up? Let's say I tell you all these array indices are zero, like all these array values are zero. Can you now say that these this last value will only be taken up by three values? Okay, uh, it can take more. That's right. But if you compare it to just i minus one, like if you filled up this part, then you can only fill this element with three elements with three values. That's that correct. So I hope this is clear and you guys will be able to do uh, what you will be, you guys will be able to do space optimization in this problem. Why? Because the ith row, I mean the states in the ith row are only dependent on, dependent on the states of the i minus one array and not any other, uh, right? So this was in this, in this problem, you cannot do what you cannot do a space optimization. Although, um, if you if you copy this and in, if instead of storing the states like the like this if you start storing the states like this i comma k oh, sorry basically like instead this was like this right k comma i what i'm saying is that instead of storing states like this you 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 know interchange these two parameters like i becomes k and k becomes i and these two parameters change so can I say then that the states of the i row will only be dependent on the states of the i plus one row? Can I say that? Only the states of the i plus one row and no other states. What I'm saying is this: just make this KP state as nothing but DP of i comma k is equal to DP of k plus, sorry, i comma k plus coins of coin i plus DP of i plus one can you do space optimization now? Nothing changed, okay? Nothing, nothing really changed. The definition of the state might change, but can you do space optimization now? You just interchange the two parameters. Yes or no? Can you do space optimization now? Because your i the states on the states of the ith row will only be dependent on the states of the i plus one row, not any more states. Perfect. So you guys get the idea that this is also kind of a trick that like it's not known to a lot of people that if you have to do space optimization, a lot of people look at their state and they're like, you know, uh, we cannot do a state. Uh, I, I mean, we cannot do a space optimization because the states of the ith row are also dependent on the states of the i plus ith row, let's say. But my question is, if you interchange the two parameters. That that helps, right? So just keep this in mind. Like sometimes just interchanging the two parameters is like kind of a really good trick to do space optimization. Um, what about this? What about this one? Can you do space optimization in this problem? The states of the i row are only dependent on the states of the i minus one row, i minus one, i minus one. We don't care about the second parameter actually. We care care about only the first parameter because that's the row in the DP table. Right, the first parameter is the row, the second parameter is the column. So as long as the states of the current row are only dependent on the states of the previous row, we can do space optimization. So can you do space optimization in the second problem? We can do space optimization in the first one, in the second, and also in the third one. And now if you don't know how to do space optimization, second lecture is the place to you know, go for that. 
fine. So is this clear? Like, are you guys learning something from this, these three? Like, did you guys learn something from these three problems? That's my question. Okay, and that is that is exactly why I recommend this problem set, which is the CSAS problem set, because every problem teaches you a lot. Okay, if you do seventy percent of these problems, a lot of problems become really easy. So that's my goal from this uh, series as well. I will try to cover at least seventy to eighty percent problems of this problem set with you guys live. So you know, so that you guys don't have to like do them on your own. The coding part is something that you have to do on your own. But yeah. So we spend quite a lot of time on the homework problems. Can we interchange parameters in any order? Yeah, you can change inter uh, you can interchange the parameters because that's nothing, right? If I tell you that uh, your parameter is like i comma j, i going this way, and j going this way, it doesn't matter if I interchange it. This becomes j and this becomes i. It doesn't matter as long as the three parameters or the four parameters or let's say any m parameters that you are using. They are clearly defining the state. It doesn't matter what is the order of those parameters. Now, obviously, you can't do you can't do something like this. You can't do dp of i comma j is now dependent on dp of you replace these two parameters here. It is dependent on something like j minus something here k and then i minus something like the l. That is not allowed. If you are saying i is the first parameter here, i has to be the first parameter here as well in the transition. But as far as the state is concerned, you are allowed to interchange these parameters however you like. So you can twist and you know play with them in order to optimize the space maybe. Perfect. Let's talk about one more amazing concept, which is the state optimization. So spend around you know one minute reading the slide. Uh, the idea in state optimization is that whenever you are you know making a state, always ask yourself whether the parameters that you're using in your DP state are they even necessary? Are all of those parameters necessary, or can you eliminate some of them? So tell me one thing here in this problem, the second problem we did something like a state optimization or not. Like first of all, we had i comma j comma k. Then we optimized it to i comma j. Was it state optimization? My question is this. Okay, somebody saying yes, but the actual answer is no. So state optimization is not actually, you know, uh, Thinking of a good state. Thinking of a good state is not the state optimization part. State optimization is this. If you know that you have, let's say, dp of a comma, b comma c, and you are not able to reduce the state further on the basis of your ideas. So tell me one thing. In the second problem, did we reduce the state on on the basis of some relation, or did we use an entirely different idea? In the second problem, when we optimized this, optimized the state from a three D state to a two D state. Did we change the idea or did we use some relation? No, we did not use some relation. We changed the entire idea. We changed how the DP, what the DP state was talking about. Right. So, I mean, I'm not going to repeat that, but yeah, in case you, in case you could not catch that, I would recommend watching the recording again. But in state optimization, it is like saying that this is the state. I cannot reduce my state further. I have no way to reduce the state further. This is the information that I always will be needing. Now, if let's say somebody tells you that C is equal to A plus C. My question here is that when you're defining your DP state, is that C parameter necessary? Or can you calculate C on spot? If I give you A plus B, can you calculate it on spot? Yeah, that's the idea. That's the exact idea about space optimization. Tell me one thing, is this optimizing anything? Is this optimizing the time or is this optimizing the space? What is it optimizing or both? It is optimizing both because when you look at the time complexity, it talks about the number of states. So, so the number of states are already reduced. You are doing just one order of one operation here in order to calculate the C. I am not saying that the C is not required. Did I say that the C is not required? The C is required in your state. It is actually required to represent your subproblem and differentiate it. But the point is that you don't need to store it every time. You can calculate it on spot. Only DP if recursive. Okay, that's a good point, Srivat. So uh, that's actually a good point. And I'm not going to discuss that. It's kind of pretty advanced. Um, the thing is that when we're doing this thing recursively, and when we are saying that remove the C parameters, this is not going to optimize the time in terms of a recursive code. 
but in terms of an iterative code, it will optimize. So the point, uh, do you guys remember that when I was comparing this recursive versus iterative DP, I said that in recursive DP, you only get to relevant states. And in iterative DP, you have to consider all states. I, I mentioned this, right? Only relevant states. So when you're coding up a recursive solution, only relevant states matter. And you will only get into the relevant states. You will never get into the, you will never like go into all states. So when you're saying DP of A comma B comma C, uh, I mean, I did not want to discuss this because like this is pretty advanced, but yeah, since you mentioned it, I, I thought of like mentioning it as well. Uh, but yeah, when, when I say that just remove the C parameter and if I'm, if I'm talking about the general DP, what am I optimizing? Am I optimizing space and time both, or am I optimizing just the space, or am I optimizing just the time? What do you guys think? In a general DP, don't think about recursive, don't think about uh, the iterative version. What is your idea? What do you think? Like when we talk about time complexity, how is the time complexity defined? It is the number of states into transition time. When we say space complexity, then also we talk about numbers, number of states. Is the number of states not reducing in both of them? Is the number of states not reducing in, I mean, uh, in both of these things, the time and the space? If I say C is equal to A plus B and I'm removing C from the entire DP state, Am I optimizing both or am I not optimizing both of them? Uh, yes or no? Yes, right. Perfect. So now the question, I'll give you a question now. Um, and let's see if you can optimize the state here. Let's say, you know, you have uh, X, uh, X blue balls. You have X blue balls. You have Y green balls. And yeah, you have, yeah, you have X uh, Y balls. Uh, I mean, X blue balls blue you have y green balls and you have an array or you have let's say a bucket you have a bucket of size n okay you want to fill this bucket of size n with these blue balls and with these green balls provided that uh, i mean x plus y obviously is greater than equal to n right this is this is obvious because then you cannot fill this entire bucket but the question is like, if you are only allowed to use X blue balls and only Y blue balls, what are the number of ways to fill this bucket up? So let's try to represent this bucket in terms of an array. You're trying to fill this array with either green or blue balls. Like any index can have a blue ball or a green ball. Something like this might work. You have a blue here, you have a green here, you have a blue here, you have a green here. Now my question is, if you're standing here and let's say there was some X, there was some Y, X and Y being the number of uh, blue balls and green balls available. My question here is, what is the information that you need at this point? What are the parameters that you need to tell me that this is what you filled up till now? Do you need the number of blue balls that you filled up so far? Would that be a valid information to store when you've reached the ith index? Would it be important to store the number of blue balls that you picked up already? Okay. The first parameter is DP of blue. DP of blue. Okay, before that, is it important to store the index? Where am I standing at? I don't know where I'm standing at. So it is, is it important to store the index? Okay, let's have a DP of index here first. Okay, now you told me that it, it is also important to store how many blue balls have we used, right? So we have blue. Is it important to store how many green balls have we used? Is that like a good, is that an important parameter in the state? No, I mean, you can get it through a relation. That, that, that's something that I understand. But is that something that I would need? Is that a valid information which would be required? You will need it, right? So we also want DP of, like we want the number of green balls that we've used. Now I will give you something here. If let's say this is index, and if I say index is something like, uh, you know, zero based index. Uh, so can I say that index plus one, minus blue is actually equal to green. If, if you have filled up, let's say 10, 10 places and five of them are blue, then it automatically means that green, I mean, the rest five are green, right? So tell me, this, this is the question. 
is green is this parameter is this parameter an important thing in the state or not that's the question one thing is it an important thing in the state yes or no it is important it is very important because at the end you will have to compare it with x and y right you will need this parameter but the question is is it something that you should store or is it something that you can calculate on spot not necessary to store right so is it clear that uh, we can represent our entire state by just dp of index comma blue or index comma green we don't need that third parameter is this fine okay tell me is this state also fine dp of blue plus index oh, sorry blue comma green can i get my index from blue and green we can't get our index from blue and green why if i tell you that you are here you are here and you have filled up uh four blue balls and two green balls where are you standing at you are standing at the sixth index or in fact you are standing actually like zero based index it's like six but one based indexing it would be actually seven seventh index is this fine that yeah exactly even if you store dp of blue blue comma green you will you still get it one more thing is can you store dp of um something like index comma green is that fine okay the motivation behind telling you all of these three things is that it doesn't matter which parameter you are excluding but which parameter should you exclude that's the question let's say i tell you that you know um you have dp of a comma b comma you have dp of a comma b comma c let's say i tell you that a is going up till 100 b is going up till 100 and c is going up till let's say 10 to the power 6 which parameter should you remove a b or c you should remove c the point is that i mean this is something some arbitrary numbers that i have given you this would not be there in a problem statement but this is just so that i can tell you that you should only remove the parameter that is like kind of the highest that you know will attain the highest value so is this clear to all of you which parameter should you remove Okay. I hope this is clear to everyone. This state optimization con uh, concept. Okay. So whenever you use this problem, uh, I mean, whenever you use this concept, uh, I think I would I would be grateful. Like I would be, you know, I would consider myself to be fortunate to have you know uh, taught this concept because this is not known to a lot of people. So now let's talk about one more concept, which is transition optimization. What do you think will happen when we talk about transition optimization? any general guesses what will happen when we like from the name itself name itself what are we trying to optimize are we trying to optimize the state are we trying to optimize the space or are we trying to optimize some transition okay somebody saying so in second problem we just needed we just think an entirely different idea and did not optimize the state yes that's right in the second problem we did not optimize the state we thought of an entirely different idea so these are two different things okay thinking of a good state but tell me one thing in this problem was was this a was this a bad state that's my question is this a bad state or is this is this information actually required this entire information is actually required but this parameter can be can be what can be derived so we don't need it but it does not mean that this is a bad state but in the second problem our first state was not a good state it was a bad state so these two are different things finding a good state and optimizing the already given good state fine so what do you think about the transition what would be a transition optimization what what are we trying to optimize in a transition any guesses we should try to optimize the transition okay let me tell you let me give you an example here let's say tell you dp of i is equal to dp of i minus 1 so on up till dp of 0 uh, like 
plus dp of sorry plus dp of i minus 2 So one, it is going up to dp of zero. Can you optimize this somehow? In order to calculate dp of i, should you like should you evaluate this entire expression again and again, or can you do some clever clever stuff to not calculate it again and again and just get the answer in order one? Look at this. You are doing something like this. You already know the dp values of this. Okay, you already know the dp values in this index. To calculate this dp value. Do you want to sum up all of these? Yes, that's right. We can do something like a prefix. Um, somebody saying dp of i minus one stores sum of sum till dp of i minus two. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Prefix sum will do, yeah. Prefix sum should do. Let's say I tell you that prefix of i, prefix of i is equal to nothing but dp of i summed up till dp of zero, or basically dp of zero summed up till dp of i. If I tell you this is prefix of i, dp of i, sorry, here, yeah. So can I say like my condition is this? Okay. Let me put this here. Yeah. I am saying dp of i is equal to dp of i minus one plus dp of um, i minus two, so on until dp of zero. And if I say that prefix of i is equal to dp of i plus dp of i minus one, so on until dp of zero, can I say that dp of i is nothing but prefix of i minus one? Can I say this? Look at the first equation. Look at the second equation. Can I say this? Dp of i is nothing but prefix of i minus one. What is the time complexity to evaluate this part? If there are n states, how many operations would it be required to calculate this this part? Order of n, right? For n states, right? What about this one? How much? How many operations do you require if you already have the value of prefix of i, i minus one? Order one. But there is one more thing that you'll have to do, which is that you'll also have to update the prefix of i. Prefix of i will be what? Dp of i plus prefix of i minus one. Is this the right equation? Prefix of i being dp of i plus prefix of i minus one. That's how a prefix sum is defined. So instead of just updating the dp, now you're having to update two values. So what did we do? We used some extra space to optimize what? To optimize what? To optimize the time. So now the question is, number of states is equal to two into n now. Time is equal to what? Is equal to n. And in the first solution, it is what? It is number of states is equal to n, but time is what? Time is n into n. Because to evaluate every state, you have n time and there are n states. So which is better, the second solution or the first solution? Which is better, the second one, right? So I hope this makes sense. That you can do some clever stuff by which you can optimize the transition part. Can you see that we actually optimize the transition part? The transition time was order of n here, but here it is order of one. So now let me tell you, let, let me give you another problem, which is nothing but something like this: dp of i is equal to Minimum of dp of i minus one, comma dp of i minus two, so on up till dp of i minus. Let's say you are standing on the ith element in an array, and it is equal to arr of i. What would you do here? Can you do a prefix sum? Can you do a prefix minimum here? Something like that. In this type of a transition, dp of i being nothing but minimum of dp of i minus one, dp of i minus two. So on up till dp of i minus arr of i, and remember this arr of i is arbitrary for every i. But what can what can you do else? Uh, what what else can you do here? Do you guys know about any data structure that can give you a range minimum? Is this nothing but a range minimum? Like is this not a range minimum here? We have an array, and we're trying to like in order to evaluate this state, we are we are saying that it depends on these states. 
This is nothing but what? A range minimum. So what can we use here? We can use a segment tree. So for people who don't know what a segment tree is, just understand that a segment tree gives you what? Uh, it gives you a range minimum in log n time. So what is the time complexity for this? Like doing something like this, like a normal normal step. It will be order of n. But once we use a segment tree, just finding this minimum would be what? It would be what will it be? Order of n, order of one, order of log n. What it? What will it be? When we are using a segment tree or some other fancy data structure, which which does the same work as a segment tree. So what do you think will be the time complexity here? In the first, yeah, it will be log n, right? When I'm saying when I'm saying time complexity, I'm meaning the transition. I mean the transition time complexity. So, are we trying to optimize? I mean, did we optimize this part, this transition here, by going from order of n to order of n, uh, from order of n to order of log n? Yes or no? Yes, we did that. So this was something that I just wanted to cover. Like uh, for people who don't know about these advanced data structures, it's totally fine. But once you learn them, you'll you'll be able to appreciate this idea even more, because this is actually used in a lot of very difficult problems. Like you won't find these optimizations in problems that are less than or equal to 1900 rated on code courses. But beyond that, uh, these ideas are very common. This transition optimization, state optimization, you can find even before 1900. But transition optimization is kind of like a little, you know, a little difficult. And it, it is a, a bit difficult only when you have to use some you know range query data structure. So I've mentioned this here, right? Okay, one more thing. Uh, in this part, like I told you, this problem there is also one clever observation that you have. Like if I tell you dp of i is equal to dp of i minus one plus dp of i minus two, so on, up till dp of zero. Can I say dp of i is nothing but dp of I minus one plus dp of i minus one. Are both these equations same or not? The first and the second. Are both these equations same? Yes or no? These are not same. Okay. Let me let me put dp of i minus one. What is dp of i minus one? dp of i minus one is nothing but dp of i minus two plus dp of i minus three and so on up to dp of z. Now can you say that dp of i is nothing but dp of i? Right. देखो था कि कौन कौन क्या था अभी पांच मिनट पहले. Okay. So was this a clever observation or was this using some data structure? What do you think? It was a clever observation. So sometimes you might require these observations as well. So have we increased the space anyhow? Like, are we using some prefix sum now, or are we just you know relying on that same DP state and just calculating the answers? Yep. So yeah, these are two ways to optimize the transition. Once you like, one thing is to use some clever observation. The second one is to use some range query data structure. Yeah, relying on previous state exactly. Fine. So is this part clear? Uh, are these two concepts crystal clear? This state optimization, we've looked at a problem. Transition optimization, we haven't really looked at a problem, but I've given you uh, given you an example already. So just in case you see this somewhere, you should like you know be able to code it up or you know like solve it on your own. Fine. So what now? How much time have we already like spent in this lecture? I don't know, but yeah. Let's solve one more problem. Uh, I mean, we're solving a lot of problems. I know it's like a little, you know, a little draining, but yeah. What will be that array description problem we rated in CF? This problem. Um, I would say, I think 1700 rated this would be. But I'll give you one problem which will which will be more than 1900 rated on code purpose. So this problem is actually very difficult. And I mean, the idea is very difficult. DP is not difficult, the ideas are difficult. Okay, so let's talk about this problem now. And what we can do is I think I can give you this problem as a homework then, or I mean, 
I can do both of them, but that will take a lot of time. Yeah, what I can do is I can do the first problem, and the second problem is kind of like a little similar to the first problem. Okay, so let's solve this problem now. And this is a difficult problem. So don't, if you don't get the idea, it's totally fine. I did not get get its idea in the first time when I was solving it like two years ago. Yeah, this is the problem statement. Yes, this is another number of ways problem. So your task is to build a tower of uh, width two and height n, and you're allowed to put in rectangles of you know like you can put in rectangles however you like into it, and you have to tell us the number of ways. Uh, the question is, can we put arbitrary sized blocks? Yes, you can. Arbitrary sized block, but they have to be rectangles. I think we'll spend like we'll. I'll give you two more minutes uh, because this is actually not very easy. So I'll give you two minutes to think about it, and then we'll, uh, you know, start with some observations. Okay, somebody saying so if the towers generate uh, towers generated are mirrored and they look different, we have two different ways, right? Yes, that that's correct. That's a good question. Uh, what he's saying is this: that if let's say this was the case, that let's say this entire part was filled up with one tower and this was filled up like with like these blocks, you are saying that are these two different or not, right? That this part is filled up with this, and this entire block is filled with one, just one. So these two are these two are different. This is different. This is different. Any observations that you have in your mind? Okay, somebody has written a very big state DP of n comma column. Let me read it. Uh, DP of n comma column comma length comma width. Okay. What does this represent? This represents the number of ways to fill till index uh, from zero to n. Like if this is a this is the tower, he's saying that we filled from zero till nth index. This point. That's fine. Um. Number of ways to fill till zero from zero to n on column 
um okay i don't understand what what do you mean by this like on the given column and with the length and width see if you assume this problem to be like this if you start solving this problem like this that uh, you know you have this entire tower and you put some random random blocks anywhere like this could be one block then this one block let me tell you this will this will not work like this is going to be really complicated so this is like a like a hint here don't don't think about this problem like trying to put some random blocks anywhere okay start from either the top or the bottom maybe you can start from here what are the two types of blocks you can put here like what are the types of blocks you can put here that's my question first of all can you put this like you know this one one block here like this is this a valid way to fill up this first row okay is this a valid way just filling it up with a you know one cross two okay perfect these are two ways when you are you know somebody saying state will depend on all previous rows yes that's a good point state can depend on all previous rows uh, you think about states like that my question is as we can add blocks of any height yes that's right that's right you can add blocks of any height so the state at a particular row might depend might depend on a states of a lot of other rows okay so raj is saying that i am also not able to understand what i had written when i said dp of n comma column comma length comma width okay that's fine but you at least thought about some state and now you know that it is not a good state so that's a, that's actually an achievement fine tell me one thing when you're talking about the first row what are the types of blocks you can put the first is to you know just put two blocks and just close them that's one way right you start two blocks and you close both of them that's one way let's let's make a you know take it to a different page yeah let's say this is your tower this is your tower here this is also your tower here also your tower here and this is let's say also your tower is this a valid way you fill the first row with two blocks of size 1 cross 1 each is this a valid way is this a valid way fill it completely with a 2 cross 1 block okay is this a valid way start i mean put a block uh, put a block on the left side and put a block on the right side both of uh, size 1 cross 1 but i'm saying don't close them right now basically this part is open basically i can close it somewhere else i have not closed this lid i can close it later on like i can close this one here and i can close this one here is this a valid way like putting both the blocks but not closing them because i can close them up later on however i like i can close this part of the block here and i can close this part of the block here that's a valid way right is this correct like putting putting two blocks but not closing them i will decide whenever i want to close them up. i am not closing them up right now and is this fine like putting a uh, two cross one sorry uh, yeah uh, it should be one cross two one cross two block but not closing it like putting a uh, putting a block like this and i'm not closing it right now i will decide whenever i want to close it is this also a valid way this one way put two blocks close them both put one block close it put two blocks don't close them put one block and don't close it Tell me one thing. Can you close this block? This block. Can you close this block like this, or you know something like? Can you close this block like this? Is this a valid way? My question is this: Is this a valid construction? This is this completely is one block. This entire thing. It is one block. Is this a valid way to fill the matrix, or uh, to fill the grid, or to fill the tower? 
it is not why because we are only allowed to insert rectangle so when i say that you are here you can only close this two cross one or uh, one cross two block like this either you close it like this or you close it like this or you close it like this right is this correct or like is this is this implementation correct okay perfect my thing uh, what i want to say here is this that instead of okay does it give you some hints now that uh, this problem can be solved with some linear dp as well now? because we have we've already constructed all the cases for a row think about this part when you get to this when you get to the next row what do you what can you do when you get to the next row what can you do what are the possibilities that you have for okay let's consider it like this you have this one case okay you filled it up like this and you did not close it up you did not close both the blocks this is what you did my question is when you get to this state when you get to the next row sorry when you get to the next row what can you do you are standing at the next row now what are the possibilities that you have for the next row my my claim here is that one possibility is that you know you close both of these blocks you close both of these blocks is that a possibility that now i am not going to extend any of these two blocks i am going to close both of them is this correct okay can i say that just close one of them and extend the other one close one of them but extend the other one what happens in case of extension this will this will go here right is this fine closing just one of them okay can i say i mean this this is this can be you know done in two ways close this one or close this one another way is this don't close any of them extend both of them extend both of these sir isn't the yes. first case already considered in that previous that's right but what i'm saying is don't consider these two cases now consider only these two because what you will understand it understand is understand uh, here is that you know this part this is nothing but it it will it will cover this one as well that is the point after a point it will also include this case so these two cases are not really relevant like when i'm saying it we are closing them up these are not really relevant when i get to the end of the tower let's say i get to the the top most let's say i'm here is it not obvious that i will have to close both of them up this is obvious right that when i get to the top i will have to close both of them similarly if there was this one like this was going like this let's say you know let's say you were here and then you put a here put a block here even if you are putting a block of 2 cross 1 here you will have to close it up so closing is something that you will always have to do at the end so my question is like why should we even consider closing right now we should just consider these two cases and you know try to solve this problem is it fine now okay perfect so i was talking about which case i think i've lost that page yeah this case my question is that if this was the case that you know you put up uh, put a block like this that you put a partition in the middle and you had two towers going up this was tower 1 going up here this one cross one tower going up and this one cross one tower going up here there is one possibility to just close both of them up that is one possibility the other possibility is to close either of them like close this one and extend this one or close this one and extend this one the other possibility is to extend both of them is it fine that you have three cases here for for this type of a tower you have three cases right what about this one if let's say you had a you know this type of a tower going up like one cross two what are the possibilities that you have now can you close just one of these parts like can you close one of these partitions when you have a one cross two cell like if i have this part if i have this part 
like one cross two going up. Can I close one of them? I cannot close one of them. I either I close both of them or either I don't close both of them. Right. So one case is just close them. The other case is extend both of them. So are you guys able to see that this case, this particular case is getting into four cases. This first one, this is the second one, this is the third one, and this is the fourth one. Uh, while the second case is going into just two, two other possibilities, it's this one and this one. Is this fine? Is this clear to everyone? Okay, is this simpler than a lot of other approaches? Are you already able to figure out, I mean, think of, or maybe visualize the solution from this point only? When I've, you know, considered these two cases, is the solution, you know, making some sense now? Like, are you able to think, or are you still completely lost when you looked at the problem state? Right? So now my question is, how do you represent it, represent this in terms of DP? Can I say this is uh, DP of I comma zero? DP of I comma zero signifying that I am on the ith row. I am at this row. I am on the ith row. And my previous, previous row had a block like this. It had two towers going up. Can I say that that is equal to DP of I comma zero? Meaning how will you fill up this, this part? The number of ways to fill up this part. Let's write it. DP of I comma zero to number of ways to fill rows from I to N such that last row had two blocks, two growing blocks basically. And DP of I comma one I'm just going to write, yeah. DP of I comma one being number of ways to fill from I to N such that last row had a one into two uh, type of block, type of growing, growing block. Sir, uh, yes. why, why have you taken from I to N? Shouldn't it be zero to I? Oh. I mean, it, it depends on how am I defining the state. You can define a different state. You tell me a different state, I will consider that. So, like you have taken the bottom of the tower to be uh, N. No, I am saying this. I am considering uh, considering this like a stack. I am saying that I am standing on the ith row. I am standing here. And I want to fill this part up. I want to fill this part up and this part has already been filled up. And what I'm saying is that in the previous row, there was a partition. There were two blocks, block one and block two. Both of them were growing up. This is similar to this condition. In this, in this part, I, I just told you that you're starting from the zeroth, star, uh, zeroth point. But when I'm saying this, I am saying that you're at the i row. So it does not, I mean, it doesn't matter where the first block was starting from. It could be like this. And the second block could be from here to here. It doesn't matter. All that matters is what type of a block have we put on the previous row? Have we put a one cross two block or have we put two blocks of one cross one? So that's DP of C, uh, I comma zero. Is that fine? Uh, can you explain again once? Sure. So what I'm saying is this. Uh, okay, you understand this part, right? What have we done here? Is like this clear I to you? understand the combinations like you have made, like how the tower can grow. Hmm, hmm, hmm. So what will happen when, you know, like you start building it up, you started from here. Let's say after this point, you, you decided to close this one and you decided to grow this one. This is how it will work, right? Uh, after the first row, this is how it will work, right? In the second row, if you decided to close this block and grow this block, is this fine? Yes. 
Okay. After that, let's say you decided to close this block and grow this block. I, I hope this should be fine as well. In the next block, let's say you decided to close both of them. And now you're standing here. So now you, you will have, you will have different choices. Don't, don't worry about that. But can you see that below every row, this is the ith row. Below every row, this will be the combination. Even if you start like this and if you, you know, put it completely close them both up, this, will, this is, how it is how it is going to look. If you, let's say, decide to grow both of them, this is how it is going to look again. Just look at the previous row. The previous row, there are only two choices. Either you have two blocks or you have a single block like this in the previous row. Are there any more, any more choices in the previous row? Either you have two blocks growing or you have just one block growing. Okay, perfect. You say yes. So yeah. Now my question is this. Let's say you're, uh, you know, you're saying that DP of i comma zero is the number of ways to fill rows from i to n such that the last row had two growing blocks. So now my question is for, for DP of i comma zero, what are the possibilities? Possibility one, close both blocks. Close both blocks is one possibility, right? But when we close both blocks, what, what is the next, what is the possibility for the ith row? What I'm saying is this. Let's say you are here and you know, you're processing the ith row and the last block had this. And you decided to close both of them up. So what are the choices for filling at the ith row? We have two choices. What are those two choices? Tell me. If I decide to close both of them up, what are the two choices that I have to fill at the ith row? The first possibility is to fill up again with a with two blocks growing both up. The second possibility is if I've closed both of them up, put a single block of one cross two growing up. Aren't there just two possibilities when I close both of them up? Is this fine? Okay, perfect. So what I will say, what is this? What is this now? What is this? This will be like uh, close both blocks. It has two possibilities. Uh, possibility one, one, uh, start two blocks of one cross one each. And the possibility two, one, two is start one block of one cross two. So what are the number of ways? Like what is this? This will be nothing but DP of I plus one comma zero. And this will be nothing but DP of I plus one comma one. Look at this, how, how, what will happen in the I plus one at row now? You will again have two blocks here, but when you do this thing, you will have just one block in the I plus one at row. Is this fine? For the possibility one, you have DP of, you will consider both ways, right? So you have DP of I plus one zero plus DP of I plus one comma one. So first possibility is done, right? Is this clear to everyone? That inside the first possibility itself, we had like two possibilities, that's fine. But is this clear? Is this equation clear? When we're trying out this thing, when we are closing both the blocks, both the lower blocks, this is what is going to happen. Okay, perfect. Now the second possibility is this. Possibility two, don't close any of them. If I don't close any of them, here, let's say this was ith row, if I don't close any of them, they both will grow, right? So can I say this is nothing but DP of I plus one comma uh, zero because both of them are growing up now. You have two blocks again for the I plus one row. Possibility three and four is uh, close one of them. Let's talk about this one. Let's say you were here. Let's say you were here and you close this, this side. What does this mean? This means that this side is going to grow. This side is going to grow, but this side is going to grow separately starting from here. Similarly, let me put a red block, red, red part here to mark this as closed. Similarly here, 
if let's say this was the side and if i close this part what is going to happen now this side is going to grow from here while this side is going to grow from grow from here is this clear this possibility but in both of these possibilities for the i plus 1 row we still have two blocks right for the i plus 1 row in both of these possibilities we have two blocks so yes or no is this clear if i just say two times on dp of i plus 1 comma 0 now what do we do when we have possibilities we just add them all up so i say dp of i comma 0 Is equal to nothing but possibility one plus possibility two plus possibility three plus possibility four, which which is equal to what? First of all, we copy the possibilities. We say this is dp of i plus one comma zero plus dp of i plus one comma one. What about possibility uh, possibility two? It was dp of i plus one comma zero. What about possibility three and four? It is two into dp of i plus one comma zero. So can I write this is nothing but dp of i plus one comma zero into four, four into this plus dp of i plus one comma one. Tell me if this is clear to everyone. Can you show position three and position four again? Sure. What what you are doing was you are closing one side. If I close this side, can you see that this part will be closing? Like if if this was starting from here, this will get closed. But if this block was starting from here, it will continue to grow. So for the i plus one row, I still have two blocks to look at. And similarly, in this side, we still have I, uh, we have two blocks to look at for the i plus one row. So if you have two two blocks to look at, you you have the zero part. If you have just one block to look at, you have the dp of i. Uh, I mean the uh, this the second dimension being equal to one. So is this part clear? Like dp of i comma zero being equal to this equation. Is this clear? we tried out all the four possibilities and then we added them up what about dp of i comma 1 look at this so if you are here and if let's say in the previous row you had both the blocks growing up what are the two possibilities you have the first possibility is to close them up close that up so possibility 1 is close the complete block what happens here you again get two choices if you close them both up you get two choices what are that you either insert one block like this or you insert another block like this growing up so this is nothing but the same as this so you say um, so for this again we have two possibility possibility one one is a start two blocks of one into one each which is nothing but dp of i plus 1 comma 0 and we have possibility 1 2 which is start a one block of 1 cross 2 which is what dp of i plus 1 comma 1 the second possibility was uh, don't close the block if we don't close it what happens we are saying that for the next i plus 1 at index we still have two blocks coming up we still have just one block coming up so we have i plus 1 comma 1 So can I say dp of i comma one is what dp of uh, we have possibility one plus possibility two. So this is nothing but Tell me if this is clear. Okay, perfect. Was this a difficult problem? Was this an easy problem? What do you think? It was a very difficult problem. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what about base case? Base case is very simple. At when you reach dp of n minus one, which is the last row, it is either you reach at zero. There is just one way to fill it up. And dp of n minus one comma one is equal to one. Okay, what about the final sub problem? 
where are you starting the problem from you're starting from the problem from the bottom uh, i mean from the bottom of the tower so you can start from 0 comma 1 or you can start from 0 comma 0 these are the two possibilities to start your tower from the bottom so is this clear this entire thing we have a state we have a transition we have a final sub problem we have everything now okay so what i'll do is i'll just uh, you know since this is like really huge so i'll just copy this and i'll put the screenshot Okay, I think this will not fit. But yeah, what should we do now? Okay, am I offline somehow? Oh, you can hear. Okay, perfect. Uh, so can you just uh, share that file in which you have written all this yeah i will just paste it here no so like when you get the slides you'll you'll get everything okay so this is the state then i'll talk about the transition so this is actually very huge Yeah, I think this should be readable. Okay, so yeah, this was actually a very difficult problem, and if I were to rate it in terms of code forces rating, um, what should I say? I would rate it as at least twenty one hundred rated. Yeah, I mean it was difficult, but uh, I hope like once you get the idea of the DP, once you are able to you know think about the combinations, it's not so difficult to think about the relation, right? So what was the most difficult part here? first of all it was very difficult to understand where do you start the problem from the second part was to think of a good enough state so what is the time complexity of the state uh, i mean this uh, this dp solution order of n right n into 2 something like that so that will work here for n being up till 10 to the power 6 and can you do space optimization here look at this transition the dp of i comma 0 is only depending on dp of i plus 1 states similarly dp of i comma 1 is only depending depending on the states of dp of i plus 1 so can you do space optimization here in this problem yes or no okay great right so people are saying yes that's great right anything else so for problem 2 i think we'll we'll take it up uh, as a homework problem and we'll uh, solve this problem next time uh, when we have a class uh, basically tomorrow right so yeah that is it for this class guys uh, i hope you all liked it and in case you liked it you can maybe write a plus one in the chat or a minus one in case you didn't like it seems impossible to solve during contest time uh, at this moment it might feel impossible uh, but i'm pretty sure like if i would have been given this problem in a contest now like once i'm a master now in code forces i would have been able to do it but yeah it is kind of difficult
Okay, so I'll just end, uh, or I'll just you know stop the recording now.